Another thing we can do with so let's another thing we can do with vectors uh, is add and subtract them. And this turns out to be something that we end up doing all the time. It's actually very important in the kind of describing physical systems we're going to do. So it's worth spending a moment thinking about how to do this both algebraically by manipulating the components of vectors and uh, what it means graphically, what it means by if you're drawing arrows in the, the physical world. <clears throat> so we have our vector r here that points from the red ball to the left corner of the screen. I guess we need the screen a little bit. All right. And so now what I want to do is find a vector that goes from the right corner of the screen, sorry, up there to this corner. That's going to be a new vector. We'll call it P. Let's not call it P. We'll call it B. Okay, so the vector B <coughs> starts at that corner and goes over there. So what do you think it's going to be? Okay, so X component. Well, what do we got? We got about one, two, two and a half meters. Okay, and is it positive or negative? Negative. So negative 2.5. What's the y component of that vector? And the z component is 0 meters. So here's a sort of 2D rendering of this. Um, here's our vector r. And there's our vector b. Now suppose I wanted to know where I'd get to if I started here and I walked uh, along the vector r and then I walked along the vector b. I'd get to this corner. So where would that location be in terms of that origin? How do I write the location of this corner in terms of that origin? It is indeed just r plus b. So we'll call this vector here is r plus b. And let's see what we get. Not surprisingly, we just add the x components, add the y components, add the z components. And so we're going to get r plus b is going to be negative 4.5 to negative 1 meters. Let's just make sure that seems sensible physically. Still negative 1 meter in the z direction. Still two meters in the y direction, but a longer distance now in the negative x direction. So we add vectors. We get a resultant vector that's the sum of two vectors that is equivalent to starting, that's the displacement of that corner of the screen from our little origin, equivalent to starting here and just walking straight to it. Notice that graphically what this was equivalent to was adding vectors by putting them tip to tail. So we had R and B, and the result was R plus B. So that's the sum of two vectors, what you get if you add two vectors. Well, algebraically, it looks like if 
this new vector r plus b, which we should let's give it a name. Let's call it let's call it c. So we have we have now an equation c equals r plus b. Looks like there's a subtraction hidden in there too, right? Vector subtraction works the way algebraic subtraction does, so we can rearrange this. We could um, so if we say we subtract b from both sides, we get c minus b equals r. Not a big surprise. And this is C. And we know that's going to work because that's how we constructed it in the first place. Notice graphically, though, what this corresponds to. We're taking two vectors and putting them tail to tail. So we have our vector R. Uh, Well, that's true. What we're really doing here is, I made this harder. This is true, but let's actually do it the other way to start with, just because it's easier to draw. We'll do this in a minute. It's true, but let's do let's do the easy thing first because it's easier to see. Okay, let's actually do C minus R equals B. And the reason that's easier is the vectors are conveniently, C and R are already conveniently drawn tail to tail, which is what we want to do when we subtract vectors. So here's R. Here's C. So when we have vector subtraction, uh, we put the vectors tail to tail, and then we draw the resultant vector, the one we're interested in, Starting at the tip of there and going to the tip of there. So this is our vector B. So subtract. Tail to tail. Now to keep us honest, because I started to do this, let's do the other one. <coughs> Subtraction. By the way, this is called, this vector B is now a called a relative position vector because it gives a position of this location relative to the tip of R, not relative to the origin. And often we're going to be interested in relative position vectors because the thing that matters when you're considering the gravitational force on a spacecraft due to the moon is not where the spacecraft is relative to a lo the origin, say, at the center of the Earth, or not rel where the moon is relative to the Earth, but where the spacecraft is relative to the moon. So we're going to be calculating a lot of relative position vectors in order to calculate things like gravitational forces, electric forces, even spring forces involve relative position vectors. So this is a relative position vector. Now, the other one, I started to do C minus B, which should be R. And there's a problem here because these vectors are not, they're not tail to tail. So we got to move one. This is OK. When we draw vectors in space, they represent positions or displacements in space. But when we start doing math with them, it is OK to move them. The key to moving a vector, though, is you can't turn it. Okay, You can't rotate it. So you've got to move it parallel. So we would have to redraw this. How? Well, we want the vector c. So that's that vector. And now we want the vector b. And it needs to have its tail there. So looks like. If we redraw it without rotating it, just 
translating it. And this was our vector r. Um, sorry, this is c. This is, I'll get it once. This is c. That's indeed b. We want c minus b. It better come out to r. So we better start a vector here at the tip of b, draw it to the tip of c. This is indeed going to be c minus b. And that is indeed our vector r. It's a little harder to see. If we put it back over here, we can see that it looks more or less correct. So it works. And it's legal to, to do that rearrangement. <coughs> OK. One key thing that we're doing when we're talking about writing vector equations, talking about vectors being equal, I just want to be very explicit about because it's important. When we say a vector is equal to another vector, that is a very stringent statement. I think I'll move the origin for a minute. It's still here. It's just invisible now. Um, because it means <coughs> a lot of different things have to be equal. <coughs> so if we say a vector d is equal to some vector f, there are a lot of things that have to be true. So if this vector d, we often write it symbolically as d sub x, d sub y, d sub z. These are the x, y, and z components of the vector. And f, of course, would be f sub x, f sub y, f sub z. There's already three different equations in here because we said that this means that dx equals fx. If this number is 2, that number has to be 2. And d sub y equals f sub y. If that number is negative 6, then that number is negative 6. And d sub z is f sub z. So if this is 2, negative 6, uh, 0.3, then this vector better be 2, negative 6, 0.3. But we're not done. There's some other things that are equal. What else is equal about these two vectors? The magnitudes are equal. So we have the magnitude of D is going to be equal to the magnitude of F. One other thing that's equal. What's the other thing that's equal? Do these vectors have the same direction? The unit vector associated with a vector specifies its direction. So therefore, it is also the case that the unit vector in the direction of D must be equal to the unit vector in the direction of f. Their magnitudes are equal. Their directions are equal. You can see that their magnitudes are equal. We're taking the same numbers, squaring them, adding them up, taking the square root. You can also see that the unit vectors are going to be equal, same direction, 